You're listening to a lecture by the St. Jerome Center for Catechesis, a Catholic website dedicated to providing Catholics and non-Catholics with material about the Catholic faith. In this lecture on the series of patristics, we will cover an overview of the study of patristics. Hi, and welcome to our study on patristics. My name is Michael Lofton. The study of patristics is the study of the church fathers. Now, the church fathers were individuals who lived in the early church, who were renowned for their contributions to the Christian faith, in particular in their writings, but also for their holiness, their sanctity, the way they lived the Christian life in an exemplary manner. Now, not all Christian writers in the early church are identified as church fathers. There's uh, four marks that are required in order for an individual in the early church to be considered a church father. The first criteria is antiquity. That is, they had to have lived in the early church. So they had to have lived somewhere between the time of the apostles until the middle of the 8th century. So an individual like Thomas Aquinas as great as he is, wonderful doctor of the church. Since he lived in the Middle Ages, he technically wouldn't be considered a church father. Now, another mark for determining who is a church father is sanctity. They had to have lived a very holy life. They had to have been known for their holiness. So if this individual in the early church um, may have been known for their holiness, but eventually fell away from the faith, you know, perhaps they left the Catholic Church, they did not remain within the bosom of Holy Mother Church, and they went to some schismatic sect, they unfortunately would not possess the mark of sanctity because they did not remain in holiness. Another mark for determining who is a church father is orthodoxy, which simply means right teaching. So this early Christian would have had to have taught that which was true about the Christian faith. So they could not have taught heresy, which is basically something contrary to what the church teaches. Now, the last mark for determining who is a church father is church approbation. You may hear this referred to sometimes as ecclesiastical approbation. It, it, it means the same thing. Church approbation simply means the church, the Catholic church, that is, has to approve of this individual as a church father. So this isn't just something that's open for anyone to determine who is a church father. It's actually something that the church has to put its stamp of approval on. Now, there are various kinds of church fathers. I'll just go over a few different types. The first is the apostolic fathers. These were individuals who were very close to the time of the apostles. In fact, a lot of them knew the apostles themselves, such as St. Polycarp, who sat at the feet of the apostle John himself. So the apostolic fathers were individuals who were very close to the time of the apostles. So they're very, very unique and thus hold a special position among the church fathers due to their um, close relationship with the apostles themselves. Now, there's another category of church fathers. These are known as the apologist fathers. Basically, apologist or apologetics simply means one who defends the faith. So these were the church fathers who really defended the Catholic faith, uh, in particular against objections that were made um, by the secular world. Individuals like St. Justin Martyr and St. Irenaeus, they were combating um, objections that were coming from both the secular world and uh, various heretical sects like the Gnostics who were teaching all kinds of heresies. So these were individuals who were, were renowned for defending the Catholic faith. Now the great doctors of the church is another category. These were actually eight church fathers. I'll go ahead and name them for you. They're Ambrose, Augustine, Gregory the Great, Jerome, Basil, Gregory of Nazianzus, Athanasius, and John Chrysostom, four from the east and four from the west. These were probably the most important early church fathers. A doctor of the church is um, somebody that has been declared by the Catholic Church to be especially um, important when it comes to the Catholic faith and their holiness. So they're not only saints, but they're um, especially and highly recommended by the Catholic Church.
Now there's another category of church fathers known as the Desert Fathers. These were individuals who were basically the precursors of monasticism. They were the first form of monks. And they went into the desert, particularly the, um, the Egyptian desert, and they would live there a life of prayer, fasting, and severe mortification. Um, especially in solitude. So they would live by themselves, um, dedicating themselves to God through prayer, fasting, and mortification. And like I said, these individuals were the precursors of monasticism, so they're very, very important to consult when it comes to the Church Fathers. Now there are three periods to the Church Fathers, three main epochs when it comes to the time span in which they lived. The first is known as the period of origins, which is essentially from the first century, that is the time of the apostles, through the third century. Now, there's another period, this is known as the Golden Age, which is roughly from 300 AD to 430 AD, right around the time of the Council of Ephesus. And then lastly, there's the decadent period, which is from 430 A.D. until 750 A.D., right around uh, the time of the death of the last church father, 749 A.D., uh, whose name is St. John Damasy. Now, there are various benefits for studying the church fathers. Of course, I'm not going to give you an exhaustive list. I'm just going to go over a few. The first is they are witnesses of tradition. This basically means that the church fathers lived in a period in which they were very close to the source of the faith, that is, the apostles and Jesus himself. So they were much closer to the uh, to the source of the faith and its purity than we are 20 centuries removed from the time of Jesus and the apostles. And also they were very important because these were the individuals who established the first creeds. Um, in fact, they established the creeds that we still use today, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. They were also important because they established the canon of the Bible. They determined which books um, belong in the Bible. Not necessarily the church fathers themselves, although some, some church fathers were involved in this process, but at least the time in which they lived, uh, these things were being fleshed out. And so they were living in a very important uh, Time. So they have much to say that we should consider. Now, of course, their words are also applicable for today. Many of the heresies that we um, come across held by some in the church today and some, of course, outside the church are heresies that were uh, in existence during the time of the church fathers, like Arianism or Gnosticism. These are all errors that we encounter today, some by individuals who are in the church, but many who are not in the church. And so it's important to consider the writings of the church fathers because they already refuted these heresies. There's no point in us reinventing the wheel. Let's just consult the church fathers, see what they said to refute these heresies, and use their arguments today. So their words are very applicable. They're very apropos for our situation today. Now, the Church Fathers are also important because they can be consulted for devotional reading and growing in the uh, Christian faith. These individuals were known for their holiness and sanctity, so they have much to say by way of prayer and fasting and mortification and growing in God's grace. So they're privileged um, individuals who can teach us how to grow closer in our relationship to God. Now, of course, like I said, there's many other reasons for studying the Church Fathers. These are just a few. I hope that I've piqued your interest in the study of patristics, and I hope that you look forward to the rest of our lectures in this series. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoyed this lecture on the study of patristics. If you would like more information about the SJCC, please visit stjeromecenter.com.